is another stalwart in his own rights, Professor Michael Domia, who has basically worked on uh, pretty much all the structural bioinformatics and structural biology field topics. And uh, Professor Domia had received his PhD in physics and is a professor at IIT Madras. His interest, as I said, varies from sequence to structure prediction, folding, stability, protein-protein interaction, protein ligand, protein uh, uh, nucleic acid. And he has published more than 260 research papers, has more than 12,000 citations, and is an associate editor in a multitude of international journals. So. Today, he's going to be talking about integrating these computational approaches and experimental data to understand this binding affinity of protein-protein complexes. And it's an honor to hear him speak and present. So, Professor Gromia, it's all to you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ragwa for inviting me to give a talk, and Professor Jun for uh, this uh, brief introduction. Actually, when they proposed the health informatics, I thought of talking about the disease causing mutations. Then I realized uh, that uh, my name was listed under molecular interactions. So I changed my topic and I will uh, discuss about protein protein interactions. Okay, I will share my slide. My screen is visible? Your screen is visible. I'll change to presentation mode. Right, it's working. It is fine, right? Okay, yeah. Right. So I'll uh, present the work on protein protein interactions by integrating the computation approaches and the experimental data to understand the binding affinity of protein protein complexes. So, first, I'll discuss about the structural analysis of protein protein complexes followed by the prediction methods how to discriminate the high and low affinity complexes and to predict the bending affinity and what will happen upon mutation, uh, whether we are able to, how far we can predict the uh, bending affinity change upon mutation and how this is related to the, uh, the disease causing mutations. Right? As you all know that protein-protein interactions play a major role in several cellular processes like the uh, ubiquitination. So it's a kind of post modification, this degradation, cellular localization, which affects uh, the activity and promote or prevent the protein protein interactions. And the signaling, so this is a complex system of communication which governs the basic cellular activities and coordinates the cell actions. Then we have the more signaling as well as molecular uh, switching, so it interacts with the different, different complexes with different affinities. So, to talk about the protein protein uh, complexes, there are two different types of uh, analysis. One is at the uh, complex level or at the large scale analysis. So here we made the two different aspects. One is on the interacting residues, that is at the complex level. So if you have a protein-protein complex, you can identify the binding sites and you can use the information on binding sites to understand the interactions which are influencing the affinity. And using the information, you can develop models to uh, predict the binding affinity or the binding sites so on. So there are various databases and uh, online tools which are available to study the protein-protein interaction. A large scale analysis is mainly on the interacting proteins. So, the kind of networks. So, this we can do with either the same organisms or you can with the different organisms like host pathogen interactions to address the uh, disease, malaria, and so on. Fine. So, if you talk about the uh, complex level, so here you can uh, do at the uh, vestibular interactions. So, we can identify the binding sites from various uh, perspectives. For example, here I give you the complex here or the uh, two proteins, one is in green color, one is in the blue color, right? So there are three different ways to identify the binding sites. The easiest and the simplest one is the distance-based approach. Here we make a cutoff of a uh, specific distance, say six angstrom or five angstrom, 3.5 angstrom, between the atoms in the binding partners, right? Either you can use alpha atoms or you can use CB atoms, or you can use the uh, all atom model, right? So here uh, in the literature, if you see, the, there are various uh, thresholds, so for example, five angstrom between NAV atoms and six angstrom between C alpha atoms, six angstrom between CBT atoms, and so on. Okay. So if you do all any any of these uh, 
uh, cut off the trend is almost similar if you take the bending propensity or the types of interactions where you can see at the interface which is almost uh, similar so if you see here this is the complex we cut into two pieces this is one and this two right here we take a distance of six angstrom so you can just use a simple uh, distance based criteria right so to calculate the distance and if it is within, uh, within the limit of any specific threshold you can see that these residues are at the interface so here you see the one complex interleukin receptor complex right so the top upper part that is the interleukin and the down part is the receptor so this see the arginine 88 in the interleukin and the aspartic acid 72 right in the receptor they form these electrostatic interactions right they are uh, at the very interface and the second aspect there is based on solvent accessibility here what we do here we calculate the solvent accessible surface area of all the atoms and the residues right at the complex and we cut into two pieces and we do it at the specific proteins then we compare the accessible surface area at, of the complex or and at the free protein and see if there is any change in the accessible surface area right so there is an accessible change, change in the accessible surface area then we uh, 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 term this as the binding site residues because there is another uh, protein which is uh, hindering this, this particular protein that means they are having some contact with these uh, binding partners right so here there is chakrabartin janin so they use a cut off of 0.1 angstrom square usually there are one angstrom square is used to identify the uh, binding site residues using solvent accessibility right solvent accessibility is the obtain right by rolling a uh, water molecule of 1.4 angstrom on the surface of these uh, uh, protein complexes or the proteins and we can see how much is can penetrate in the van der waals surface of each atom right, in a protein and the uh, here is shown example okay, so here uh, you see the residue number and here the residue name here this is the uh, the complex this is the free protein so if in the when they make the complex right they change the accessible surface area for example here from uh, 12.2 to 0 that's completely buried in the uh, complex but it is uh, uh, exposed uh, to say 12.2 uh, and some right at the uh, free protein that is that is the unligand uh, protein so this is how we can identify these binding sites so we have another method that's called energy based approach here here we calculate the interaction energy between each residues in the binding partners for example if we have two uh, we have two dimer the two proteins right get the interaction energy okay this is the van der waals uh, sixtal potential and here this electrostatic uh, interaction energy so we calculate the interaction energy right and then if you find the cut off of any specific uh, energy so you have to identify whether this residues are the interface or not so here i show the data so we calculate we set up a data set uh, of uh, about 150 complexes that is completely uh, heterodimer complex it's not homodimer so and then we calculate the interaction energy for all possible pairs at the uh, of all the combinations right so here then we uh, divided this into different bins of point uh, 1 kilocal per mole and x axis you can see the interaction energy range and the y axis you can see the frequency right so i show the two plots one is at the uh, blue one this is for each bin right and the green one that is a cumulative values And if you see in the green with the blue one that is about 70% right which are uh, close to zero that means this 73% of the residues which are not uh, in contact right, with the uh, with the residues in the partners okay. so the uh, green one is the cumulative ones so you can see total the one so mostly uh, you can see uh, if the cut off of minus 1 kilocal per mole that is about 5000 residues that is around 10% of the residues which are at the interface If we use a cutoff of minus 0.5 kilocal per mole, you can see about uh, the fourteen percent of the residues which are at the interface. We compare this data with the uh, distance based criteria, and there are uh, generally it, we can see the similar residues. But some cases, if it's very close because the re repulsive interactions, some residues are missing in this energy based criteria. So now the next question is: Okay, you can uh, identify the residues. Were there any specific preference of residues at the interface? So here we calculate the binding propensity, right? That is given as n bind of i. That is the number of residues of each type i at the binding site. Normally, it's with the number of residues uh, residues in the complex. So I made the two classes. One is receptor and ligand. That is just I did not uh, uh, classify based on the functions. Here just a classify based on the molecule. So if it is higher one, it will be considered as receptor, and if it is lower one, it is a ligand. So if you see in the receptor, okay, so mainly the residues are arginine. 
and the tryptophan and the tyrosine, these residues are highly uh, preferred at the interface. We got a similar preference in the ligand also. You can see the tryptophan uh, lysine as well as the uh, tyrosine, which are preferred at the ligand also. The numbers are high, it is because the number of residues in the ligand is small, because we consider the low molecular weight uh, protein as the ligands. The next question is, okay, so you find uh, some residues which are uh, preferred at the interface, whether any specific preference for the partner. So whether we have any uh, uh, partner residues, interacting pairs at the interface. Here I show one example, that is the bring origin and tryptophan in 1R27, right here the energy is minus 6.2 per per mole. Then we calculate the binding pair preference using this equation. So the preference of I comma J, so we can calculate, right? So this Nij, where Nij is the number of residues of type I, that is in one protein, which is interacting with the uh, residues J in the partner. So we normalized with the uh, sig uh, sigma N of I and the N of J. This is the type I and type J. This is the possibility all combinations of this number of residues of type I in the protein 1 and the J in the protein 2. So if you see the preferences, you can see some uh, pairs are highly dominant, specifically if you see aspartic acid and arginine. Interestingly, you can see other way around is also fine. So it this doesn't matter if you consider the first one as a receptor or the second one as the receptor. Right? Always, also you can see the arginine and tyrosine. So you can find the same uh, preference tyrosine and arginine and tryptophan tyrosine, tyrosine, tryptophan and so on. Right? So now next question is, okay, first we identified the residues which are the interface. And the second, we find the interactive partners. Now, the, the third issue is whether these interactions are made with the main chain atoms or side chain atoms. That means it is specific or non-specific, right? So then we group the atoms into main chain and the side chain, right? So you can see the receptor ligand. And the side chains, which are uh, uh, which is better interaction than the receptor, that means most of the interactions are with the side chain. And the, you, can, you can tell that, okay, the, the interactions are mainly uh, very specific uh, uh, at the complex. Fine. So now we wanted to know whether these uh, uh, preferences, which are influenced with specific type of interactions, like the positive and negative charge, like electrostatic interactions, and the aromatic residues, and the positive charge as cut and by interactions, and the aromatic aromatic interaction, so on. So are there any uh, specific preferences using the experimental data? That is thermodynamic data for binding. So we collected the data based uh, for the protein uh, protein uh, binding affinity, right? So here we can identify the hotspot residue. So we put the cutoff of uh, two plaque per mole. That means by the mutation of in alanine to, from any residue, if it changes the affinity of more than two plaque per mole, you identify this as the uh, hotspot residues. We try to evaluate the preference of residues, right? So here we can say that around 217 interactions and there are 68 are uh, unique interactions. And we see most of the residues are charged residues and some of the positive charge residues are aromatic residues and the hydrophobic residues are less. It's mainly because we consider mainly these heterodimers. These data are also from the heterodimeric complexes. So this will tell you that importance of some specific interactions like the aromatic interactions or electrostatic interactions or cut and pull interactions. So we wanted to explore whether these the complexes are influenced with this specific type of interactions. So I, I will, analyze the various complexes and I show a specific examples, right? Here, this is uh, uh, one complex, that is the uh, E6AP and UBCH1 complex, mainly influenced with aromatic interaction, right? So here, uh, this group, they evaluated the binding affinity, that is free energy for 49 mutants, and they identified 15 mutants as a hotspot residues. And among these hotspot residues, mainly the residues which are involved in right? the hotspot residues are mainly the positive charge residues or the negative charge residues or these aromatic residues. Right? Then specifically, I gave one example. So they mutated the phenyl alanine at the position of 63 into alanine. We changed the binding F and G of three collectors per mole. So in the structure, if you look at the structure, okay, if you see here, okay, this is the interaction between the phenyl alanine and the tyrosine. Right? So you can see the interaction energy of minus uh, one collector per mole. Right? So uh, this will show that, okay, if you mutate any of these residues that decrease the binding affinity that's already observed uh, in experiments. So this is another example. Here they show the importance of cut and pi interactions. In this case, they mutated, right, the tyrosine 127 to alanine. So here they identified that the mutation of this tyrosine, right, decreased the uh, binding affinity of 2.2 collector. If you look at the structure, this 1 to 127, it having the uh, uh, interaction with the origin 85. Right, we have the interaction energy of minus uh, two per mole. 
and we wanted to know whether this interaction energy is mainly due to the benzene atoms or cyclene atoms so we uh, dissected the interactions to based on the main chain and side chain they so found that most of the uh, the energy is from the uh, side chain side chain atoms so that means we are told that okay these cation co interactions are uh, dominant mainly uh, have these particular uh, mutants right so the interactions are very important and if we mutate any of these residues that will decrease this uh, binding effect i found more example here this is for electrostatic interaction interestingly if you see that here this uh, 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 lysine 32 and aspartic acid 238 we can form electrostatic interactions and in this study they mutated both the residues so uh, lysine 32 they mutated to alanine so this also changed the binding affinity and the uh, aspartic acid d 238 to alanine so here also they changed the binding affinity of p9 and the cell so if you see these two uh, residues k32 and d238 okay can see here this is a positive charge and is a negative charge they form the electrostatic energy it is very strong there is a minus uh, to kelkel uh, per mole uh, this is showing the importance of this electrostatic interaction okay so now from this analysis we found that some interactions are very specific and some residues are dominant at the interface and next question is is it possible to use this interact this information for any of these prediction algorithms whether you are able to discriminate the high and low affinity complexes or where you can we are able to predict the binding affinity of any uh, protein to protein complex and so on okay so uh, we try to discriminate these protein protein complexes uh, based on the uh, interacting residues and other uh, properties right and mainly the two different classes only the transient complex and the permanent complex we made the uh, two specific two classes and we try to discriminate okay whether your protein protein complex is the transient or it is the uh, permanent complex right so these are the various procedures that we use try right, to develop an algorithm right so first we need to have a good data set that is very important so once we develop the data set uh, we can develop the features right then from this feature said right, all the features are very important are necessary for this binding affinity that depends on the problem so we need to select the features right once the features are selected then we relate this uh, features and the data set using specific methods either we can use statistical methods or we can use some machine learning technique right to relate these features and the data sets then we relate it then we can assess right, whether uh, uh, the performance is good or not so we can uh, use it uh, using the various assessment like the correlation or the sensitivity specificity uc and so on so then we can validate you can use various validation procedures like uh, self consistency or jack naive for only one of class validation or in for class validation type right? so uh, split sampling technique and the, uh, the you can validate your method whether it is uh, uh, fine or not once it is done you can develop a server that you uh, the so that uh, the users can use right uh, for uh, predicting this binding affinity okay so when we started the work so at that time we got on 85 complexes right so you have the protein you have the complex and we have the uh, kd values or the kd values right so we made two uh, groups one is for the discrimination and for the prediction right so the for the discrimination we made two groups right and we used the sequence based features right and the prediction we also use some uh, features based on the structures and the sequence and we develop a method and also several potential applications because the method is based on the sequence and you can easily apply this method uh, mainly there are various uh, complexes or the protein protein uh, complex that uh, reported in the dap or the bind databases if here this uh, o2h experiments or this spr experiment they can tell that okay this uh, uh, proteins interact and whether it's a high binding or low binding that it is not available so we can use these sequence based features to analyze this uh, interacting proteins we also did the constructed network for the uh, human pathogen interactions and we see whether in hub proteins which are mainly with the uh, low affinity complexes or the high affinity complex and so on so you can do this the, the for the protein protein interact networks in various species okay so we construct the data set right we have the data set and then Uh, we have the binding of unit data so then on the other side we first try get the all the uh, properties from the index database but if you see the index database many properties which are which have no meaning uh, so if you see many cases some uh, values are missing for some some amino acids many cases they give some uh, random numbers without any meaning so we manually uh, curated this uh, uh, features and we reduce the number of features set right, to about 50 to 60 features which are relevant to protein protein complexes then we use the additional features that's what we obtain from this our analysis like the uh, 
positive charge residues or aromatic residues or they had uh, the the residues which are forming electrostatic interactions and we use other other features then we use the feature selection method to to identify the specific features which are important for this discrimination and then you then with these features we develop uh, machine learning techniques uh, this time we use product machines to discriminate the uh, high energy complexes and so now we have it finally we selected the five features the mainly the alpha helical propensity or the beta sheet propensity or side chain bulkiness and the predicted number of binding site residues and the number of the aromatic and positive amino acid residues of the binding sites we did that and as i mentioned earlier the the aromatic and positive charge residues right which are identified to be important at the binding interface so we analyzed these type of interactions at the high affinity complexes and low affinity complexes and here i show the data this x axis shows the number of uh, residues the y axis is the percentage of complexes right and the green one you can see that is the high affinity complexes if you have more than 9 residues that means the aromatic and positive residues you can see this mainly the high affinity complexes and otherwise you get this almost similar in the case of the low affinity complexes that means these residues are important uh, for the interaction between the binding partners okay we use uh, machine learning techniques right so i don't explain the details so there are a various software available right and there's also the we have the platform called veka so that also one can use uh, for the machine learning techniques so we use neural uh, networks and support vector machines right we assess the performance using sensitivity specific diagnostic so based on the true positives true negatives false positives and uh, false negatives right so if the experimental is positive and the predicted is positive then this is true positive and the experimental positive and the predicted is negative that means that is a false negative on the other hand if experimental is negative and is uh, over predicted that is called false positives if both the low affinity complexes is true negative so we consider the high affinity as the positive and the low affinity as the negative in this case so sensitivity you can calculate so the true positive divided by true positive plus false negative specificity also can calculate based on this uh, number of low affinity complexes that are predicted accuracy is the overall assessment so we did that so the tenfold class validation right so here we get the accuracy of 77% right and 79% then we evaluated the performance using a training set of 155 complexes and with the test set of 30 complexes right here with the other test set we are looking at a similar performance like the sensitivity and specificity of about 80 81 85% with accuracy of 83% right so then uh, we collected more data right uh, so with the uh, later on so the 464 complexes and we reduce the uh, sequence identity with less than 25% right so we use the training and test complex we are also almost similar performance right uh, the identity discriminant in the by high and low affinity complexes okay so now we did the analysis based on the analysis first we try to discriminate right so now the next the next target is okay if you whether is you are able to predict the binding affinity right so we use similar approach we use a similar approach here we collected the complexes with uh, non uh, delta g uh, or uh, kd values right so we use this uh, various classification first we try to use all the 182 complexes together to predict delta g or the kd so with the correlation was very poor so then we try to classify the complex based on various aspects like for example uh, we use the, uh, the function classification we use the based on molecular weight and we used the predicted uh, percentage of binding site residues and the percentage of aromatic and positive charge residues and the percentage of hydrophobic residues in the binding sites so we used various uh, properties right, to classify the complexes right but finally we uh, noticed that based on the functions right which could uh, discriminate better so and then we finally ended up with classifying the complex based on functions to predict the binding affinity changes right so this is our workflow so we collected the data set here this here we have the feature selection so we removed the redundancy between the features and we filtered the important properties finally we filtered about 60 features and the data so we classify into seven groups based on the uh, functions and we developed linear regression technique right and then we evaluated with live on cross validation then once if the method is fine so then we try the external blind set even if it works fine then we uh, develop this server okay so this is the principle of least squares so we use the regression models to get the five questions and we evaluated uh, based on the correlation and the with the mean of zero data okay here is the data so these are the various uh, classes 
and this is your uh, classification result is the result and we get the uh, fairly uh, good agreement between the predicted and experimental values so here is a, a plot connecting experimental and the predicted values in some cases yes, we are not able to predict uh, very well for several complexes because we are not using the structures and the some of the cases the structural interactions that we are not able to take into account so that is the reason why there is some deviation for several complexes Okay, then we repeated this with large complexes and we could uh, get similar results. So then we developed a server. Here you can uh, identify the uh, function and we give the sequence, right? And it will the, take the sequences and the type and then you can uh, predict the matrix. Fine. So we did the analysis and the discriminate the binding uh, high and low affinity complexes and the uh, binding affinity, uh, right? Of the complex. Now, the next question is what will happen if we mutate a particular residue at the interface? Whether this will increase the affinity or this will decrease the affinity, or is it possible to predict the binding affinity change upon mutation? Right? right. So, in this case, first we need a data set anyway. So, we developed a database for the binding affinity of protein protein complexes and their mutants. And we try to understand the effect of double mutations. If you are a double mutation, is it possible uh, to, uh, uh, to evaluate whether this uh, affinity is additive or non-additive, right? And then we try to understand the features which influence the bending affinity uh, upon mutation. And using the information, we developed a method to predict the bending affinity, right? And then we developed the server and analyzed the disease-causing mutations with bending affinity change. Okay, so this is the workflow. So we uh, checked the available data in the literature and most of the available databases were obsolete at that time, right? And many databases did not uh, update. And on the other hand, we checked the literature. There are various uh, data available in literature. So we did the thorough check and what are the data available in the uh, data, various databases, we collected data and we checked the literature, right? So we have more number of data from the literature than the other databases. And the database we clearly mentioned whether the data are obtained from the literature or they are obtained from the any specific database. Right? So we collect the data regarding interacting proteins or the, and the mutations and the structures, function class. And based on the experiment, we uh, get the information regarding techniques used, whether it is ITC or this PR. Right? And uh, we can use these uh, conditions like ionic conditions, pH, and temperature. And the data, so we can get the KD value and the data data G. Data guys, data guys, and so on. Then finally, we give the reference. Right? So we give the link to our databases and we extract information regarding the sequence and the structure and the motif and the uh, accessible surface area and so on from the other resources. So we put everything in data in the internet database and we have search options and uh, we have the option to download the data. Right. So anyone can search the data and get the data. And if anybody is interested to get all the data, to, then they just they send an email to us with the agreement form. So we send the all the data. Right. Already sent to the several researchers. So then this can be used for the analysis as well as for the prediction. Okay. This is our uh, home page. Right. So and here this is the uh, search options. We have a simple search option and advanced search options to collect the data, right? So if you have a simple search, you can just give any uh, keywords or any com name of the complex, just it will give you all the data. For the advanced search, right, you can uh, use any, any names. If we give the first name, okay, already we give the list of uh, complexes used in the available in the database. So if you give type the one or two letters, it will show you all the complexes available in the database. So you can select. If we select the first one, then automatically the second one will be selected. If there are more complexes with, the, with respect to the first one, then it will show you the option. Otherwise, it will automatically select it, right? So, and then you can have various options to search. You can search with the function class, you can search with the mutation, you can search with the secondary structure or ASA or the values, which, which whether you need the, only the increase in binding affinity or decrease in binding affinity or very high change in the binding affinity, anything you can use. The right side, I give you a display of options. So there are various terms we use in the database and if you display everything, it's a big mess. So we give the display options and the users have the flexibility to choose any of these terms to be displayed in the output, right? And here we can show the results, uh, how many results you want to display in, in every case. And interestingly, we give one information that is where exactly the data are available because one of the reviewers asked right, to cross check the data, right? 
better to give the place where you get the data exactly the page number or the any table or any line number you got it so we gave that all information also in the database so the user they can directly go to that uh, paper and that page right so they can get the numbers exactly from that place so this is a example okay if you see this will be id and this is our mutation this is a protein 1 and protein 2 and this is a secondary structure and the asa and we have the mutation kd and wild type kd this is a difference right and we have the delta g delta g and here you can see this is the pmid in the table 1 page 1177 you can get this number okay this is what we gave there and here we give whether it is obtained from other databases we give the database and if you obtain from the literature so we here we give this uh, literature reference right so so that you can know that where we can we got the data so this is the statistics page so you can have this is uh, details of this particular uh, complex right this uh, bovine trypsin and the beta trypsin this were experimental data with the kd is uh, 5 14 molar and this were experimental conditions and the, the basis of the calculations and we link with the string database i think right so here you your uh, main proteins here and you are connected with what are the other uh, proteins in the string and we have all the information on the string and we give the uh, link to the string database right this is what the reference right we give the biochemistry and this so we have statistics here this is the number of complexes the number of known structures and the entries and so on so this is the experimental techniques we use and the range of the different experimental parameters and so on Okay, this is a mutation information. This you okay, can see there are many aligned mutations because uh, most of the data from aligned scan mutagenesis. That is the reason why we get more number of aligned mutations. Also, we can get other mutations also. For example, here, glycine deuterine and uh, aspartame deuterine and so on. So other mutations right, which are also uh, available in the literature. This is a comparison of databases. So these are the other databases when we uh, publish our paper. So uh, these are the various options we use in our database. Some of them uh, other options also in the databases. Some options are not available. So we try to address all the available options that are not available in the databases, right? So we did that uh, in our database. We link with the uh, other related resources like PubMed or the String and the and the in you know, the PDB and so on. And then we have this uh, SCMB and then other databases. Okay. So now the next question is: So we have the data. So whether we can analyze. Uh, the additivity effect of the double mutation, or you can predict the uh, binding affinity change upon mutation, right? Or how how far the disease causing mutation in the interface which are influenced with the binding affinity change. The uh, first I'll uh, discuss. I think I have ten more minutes. So additivity effects of this double mutation, right? So here you can see delta delta g, right? So you can see the the mutation one, this y is mutation two. Now we put the coupling term. The coupling term is close to zero. Then delta delta g for x y equal to delta g x plus y. In this case, it is additive. So otherwise, it is not additive. And how to define this coupling term? That's a problem. So we have various options. Either we can use any specific uh, energy, for example, point five or one kilocal per mole, or we can see in a deviation, say ten percent, twenty percent, and so on. So we did that. So we used various classification, for example, with respect to this energy, or with respect to the percentage of deviation. Or combination of these two, right? So finally, we selected the less than one kilocal per mole as the uh, criteria for uh, mutations which are additive or non-additive. Okay, so here we can see the additivity, right? Only for the affinity, only for the stability, and you can see the difference. Okay, here if you see this uh, minus 15, 25. Here this is very close, right? You can see the difference between the affinity and the stability. Here we use the similar data available in the our uh, proximal database as well as for the the protein database that also we developed some few years ago, right? And we updated very recently, right? Fine. So now we analyze we based on the various structure based features because structures are known because to understand the Uh, additivity effects. We use the uh, known structures, right? And we did the structural analysis, like distance between the mutations, a number of contacts for each mutation, and different types of non-covalent interactions, an accessible surface area, whether the heterophobicity, right, has an influence, binding propensity, V factors, and so on. Here I show an example. Here the number of contacts. Okay, you can see the non-additive mutations so tend to be closer to each other in the case of this uh, than the additive mutations. So also in the here, if you see the blue one is additive and the red one is non-additive, you can see the non-additive mutations right here. Additive mutations right here that is very close to each other between four uh, to twelve angstrom between two mutants. 
and then with the number of contacts here also you can see non additive mutation which have more number of contacts right between the mutations than the additive compounds uh, uh, mutations and this number is very profound and we could see if you use the mutation which are additive or additional only so other structural based features we calculated but we could not find any any significant difference the data not statistically significant so i just uh, left that then the reviewer asked whether if you use this parameter are you able to discriminate right so the attitude non additivity we tried to develop a model but the model is fairly good but it's not very high performance but still it is it works uh, fairly well to uh, to discriminate the uh, additive and non additive mutations okay so then the uh, we developed a method to predict the binding effect of one mutation so in this case we define delta energy which is equal to delta g mutant minus delta g so we get about 2000 mutations and we use various features right and we as we explained earlier so we classified based on the functions and we developed various uh, regression models right to predict the binding effect change of one mutation this is our result okay so these are the various uh, features and we have the different complexes and this is the results right this is the number of uh, data and the correlation and the mean absolute error for the cross validation and for the test set okay here we can see show the figure between the experimental and the predicted uh, binding affinity change on mutation right so you can see it, it, it works fairly uh, well right then this is the next set of data because after we publish our data so there is another group that they publish around 200 data right so then we use the our method right just directly apply it to that method and in that case also we could uh, uh, perform very well right in that particular new data set so here are few cases where our method did not very perform very well so here only person did perform well this was to use like in 15 aspect you want it this form of electrostatic interactions see when you disturb these residues it lasts the bending energy okay so we also did we our case also it uh, correctly predicted as it reduced the bending energy but the energy is uh, not very but our our is predicted very less energy but here uh, they used the more than two electrical right this is another complex that is called barnes barsher complex here uh, there are uh, this is loosely packed and several water mediated contacts and hydrogen had hydrogen bonds so this is not able to uh, account that right, never complex in our method that is the reason why we have the poor performance for uh, this example we had analyzed several complexes we systematically analyzed all the uh, outliers and we published uh, all the data right in the paper okay now we compared the methods with the another data set here you can see uh, different structure based methods with our second best methods right so our second best method is also not uh, uh, bad it's also performing similar to the structure based methods in that case we can tell that okay so we can also this uh, method if the uh, structure is not available so we use the for the covid 19 cases there are these cases we uh, because it's very fast so we try to uh, produce when you have to change of one mutation at the interface of this spike and the ce2 or spike in antibody complexes and we did the analysis but i am not showing the data now so now we one of the reviewers he asked about the homodimers what will happen whether you uh, predict this homodimer so then we did the analysis so interestingly the our method this perform better in homodimers than the heterodimers so you can see the rl is 0.78 ma is less that is 0.61 glycal per mole for the case of the 76 mutations in uh, 11 complexes then we develop this our right so you can uh, uh, give this your uh, sequence chain a and chain b and the functional class you can give here and if you give your mutations right so this will give you the uh, predicted delta g and the category will decrease or increase the bending energy so on that's fine so last part i think i can finish maybe in another uh, okay two three minutes i'll finish this uh, this part okay so then we try to analyze the binding affinity change with the discussing mutation initially so we got the similarly known delta energy as of 1788 mutations and we collected the disease causing mutations right from the uh, uh, cost and the uh, fever based this fever based is the our database we developed in our uh, lab and we also use comes over uh, clever on the databases right and here we compare this 1788 right with this uh, known disease causing mutation we want only 194 matches and the 194 if you see the binding of the there's binding affinity on experimental known this is causing mutation experimental known is completely experimental known information so you can see out of 194 142 decrease the binding affinity that is about 73% decrease the binding affinity 
And that means, okay, the change in vanity of is attributed, right, with this, this is causing this. Among these 142, 50 are uh, having the decrease in annual probability of more than one clinical per month. That's about 35%, right, so decrease the vanity uh, of more than one clinical per month. Then most of the data, you know, that in the disease causing medicines are, so we analyze separate cancer disease, but cancer, we couldn't find much difference. If you see the, the cancer and other diseases, cancer only 71% at right, the decrease of affinity, but the other disease, it is 85% will decrease the uh, binding affinity because the cancer binding affinity is not the major cause. There are various other factors right, that also influence the cancer. Okay, that we did the case study and we identified uh, the uh, disease progression for the cancer is different from that of the other diseases. Okay, so here we uh, did that. Uh, experimental. Now we did the experimental lethargy versus predictive pathogenicity. So here we took the experimental uh, lethargy values from the proxy database and we predicted the pathogenicity with the different uh, methods like mutation, xer, polypen, proven, shift, and so on. It's a consensus data set. And if you see here, the disease causing mutation, that is the 1.24, but in the case of neutral, it is uh, just 0 0.35, right? So this, uh, the, that is the average change in binding affinity. So that means the change in binding affinity is very high in the case of disease causing mutations, right, compared to the neutral mutations. Here I show the distribution, how it happens. Okay, we see here it is the disease causing mutations, which is the right side, right? And then we analyze whether it is the heart spots, the disease mutations. So we calculate the odds ratio, right? So this is the, we use one clinical per mole uh, based on this reference. And if you use it, so you can see 9.9%, 9.93 odds, odds ratio, mainly in the case of these heart spot issues. That means uh, odds spot issues are highly influenced with the disease causing mutations. Then we deal with the cancer and different cancer types and the different diseases. Cancer is almost similar to the values, but other, other diseases, you can see the high change in the body. Then we did the analysis for the specific examples. So various diseases we analyze and this change in body affinity and this affects the, the activity and hence, okay, you can see the, the disease. Okay, in conclusion, I think I discussed about the, uh, the recognition mechanism. So what are the various uh, interactions? And we developed methods for discrimination prediction and the binding affinity upon mutation. We, I discussed about database and activity as well as the method and related the binding affinity change with these discussing mutations. I think I thank my students said, who did the work uh, for the binding affinity and this funding from the different uh, sources. And these are the reference books. Uh, the protein interactions contain most of the information regarding the talk. Thanks for your kind attention and I'm glad to take a few questions. Uh, 